becoming an entrepreneur, starting a business is not necessarily uh, contingent on coming up with the next big idea, but it's about leveraging the idea that's out there and actually making the most of it. This is Don't Fear Grit with Wob Taormina. Marketing strategies and advertising technologies to help you build a better business. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Don't Fear Grit. So excited to be back here in the studio to record some fresh content with you guys, for you guys. And we've got some brand new stuff in the tank, starting with a brand new format that we're going to be rolling out, starting with today's episode. Uh, We're going to be chopping things up into series of three. And uh, this next series, we're going to be talking about the collector's market, um, how entrepreneurs fit into the collector's market. In fact, how they help create markets um, for various items throughout history. Um, We're going to be also bringing someone on board who is, in fact, a collector to talk about his experience, to share some light on the subject, and then we're going to be closing it out to give some practical tips. Uh, It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm going to just dive right into the topic and give you guys some of the juicy value right up front. And uh, for those of you who are uh, listening to the show and you're not watching, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you guys to really visualize what we're going to be uh, showing to our our video audience here, but I'll do a, a pretty good job at describing what it is that we have here in the studio today. Um, But to help us talk um, about the collector's market, I wanted to pick something that was a sort of a a quick hit um, in the, in the, in the frying pan, so to speak. Um, Something that was really popular and then just sort of fizzled out uh, to be represent representative of, of this sort of topic of the collector's market and entrepreneurism and all that other stuff. Um, and there's a, there's a number of things I've could have uh, chosen, but I wanted to choose something that w- was something that I experienced that I was a part of. Um, this way I can speak sort of with authority on it and I'm going to bring it into frame. And that is pogs. Now, if you were born after, I would say probably, you know, in the mid nineties, you have no idea what a pog is. Um, however, um, if you were a uh, sort of like an older child, a tween, or even as some teenagers were into it, um, into the early and mid nineties, you absolutely know what this is. You absolutely had a pog and you probably uh, gambled a bunch of them away or you gambled and won a lot of these pogs because they were so popular back in the early nineties. Uh, a little background of what a pog is. It's a game. Um, it's a game and you get these little pogs that you can see here. Uh, it's like, like cardboard things. The game really originated as being like milk uh, uh, caps. Um, but the idea of the game is you have a pog, you have a slammer, um, all the pogs are face down, you have your slammer, and you throw it down on the pile. And whatever pogs end up flipping right side up, the person who was using the slammer gets to keep. So it's a, a, it's a very simple, fun game that you could play. Um, they say that the the game of Pogs originated with a game that was called, I believe it was a, uh, Menko. Um, it was a Japanese game that originated in uh, the 17th century. Um, very similar in nature to Pog and Slammers, uh, where the Pogs even had characters on them. Oddly enough, even if it was dated uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, um, it, I think they featured like uh, samurai figures and whatnot. Um, but anyway, um, uh, as that sort of uh, game from that culture made its way to the, you know, uh, to the, you know, across the Pacific there into the uh, uh, Hawaiian Islands, um, the game sort of uh, brought, was brought along with those people, and they continued to play this game, and it evolved like many other things. Um, became again really big in the early 1900s, um, as you know, people didn't have a lot of money, but they, you know, kids needed to uh, entertain entertain themselves, and they're very fairly industrious back then. And they just figured out how to you know, find these little things out of milk uh, milk caps and they continued playing the game but it, it wasn't until i would say maybe like about 1990 where it was popularized again in hawaii it made its way to the mainland and very very quickly uh there was a craze and a gentleman by the name of i believe it was alan uh rabinsky uh, he was an entrepreneur and he saw a like a newsreel on this whole thing about this game that was becoming popular amongst kids in schools. And as an entrepreneur, within a few months, he snapped up the trademark, got the licensing, and then started to mass produce them. And within 18 months, had sold $25 million worth of this little circular piece of cardboard, which is pretty wild. 
Um, so again, if you're just tuning in now and you're listening, we're talking about pogs guys. And which is pretty wild that something like this just picked up steam and a gentleman, um, decided to, uh, you know, try to capitalize on, on the craze. And so there's a lot of really great nuggets that we could pull from this, um, is about opportunity. He did not create it. And this is what I want to actually focus on is, you know, making money, becoming an entrepreneur, starting a business is not necessarily, uh, contingent on coming up with the next big idea, but it's about leveraging the idea that's out there and actually making the most of it. In this case, this is what this guy, Alan Rubinsky did. He saw the craze, he saw the market, and he said, I could do something with this. I can scale this. I can bring this to the masses. And the ability to execute is actually the difference between successful entrepreneurs and non uh, people who are not able to experience success because a lot of people get caught up in what is the next idea? I need to get my whiteboard out and figure this out, get into the laboratory, figure out figure out what the next uh, thing is and invent something. You know, you can be you can spend a lifetime in the, in the lab, never come up with anything of value, and if you simply just put that same type of effort into actually like this guy did and making use of something like the pogs, then you can experience your success. And now in this case, he did it. Now it may have been short lived, but at least he was able to strike when it was hot. And that's the whole idea of the pog. Now history is filled with stories like this absolutely filled with stories. Sometimes it's like the pog where it's just a few short years and it literally disappears. Other times there's uh, more ebbs and flows and they stick around for a little bit. That That's like the uh, uh, baseball card, uh, the sporting card uh, game. Now, when, uh, when I was a kid, the sporting cards were huge, uh, huge. I mean, in the, in the 80s, I remember going and getting a, a pack, uh, a wax pack of cards for like 25 cents. Um, and uh, I remember I was having this this conversation with Craig, the producer of the show here, who's behind the scenes. Um, and I was like, yeah, when I was a kid, I, I used to pay 25 cents. And he was like, how old are you? I'm like, I'm not I'm not old. It's just, you know, we've experienced a little bit of infl- inflation, I guess. But but I decided to bring in, this is literally a wax pack. I'm a saver. Like I, I actually was the kid when I got my McDonald's Happy Meal and the toy was in it, like wrapped in plastic. I never even took the plastic off. That was just who I was as a kid. I For some reason, I, I thought it's going to be worth more. I don't know why I had that that mindset. No one taught me that. It was just sort of this uh, sort of like innate thing that I had. But anyway, this is literally a wax pack from when I was a kid. This is 1990, uh, 1988, right? And when you open it up, what you see is, guess what? 25 cents. Craig, see? It's proving it. They were 25 cents for a wax pack. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually as part of, part of episode, uh, three, I'm going to like probably freak Craig out and freak a lot of yous out. Um, Craig, what, what camera are we on right now? We're over here. All right, here we go. So, um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to freak everyone out and, and I'm going to actually, uh, open up one of these wax packs. Uh, they have not literally, I've had them sealed. There's a number of them in there, uh, since 1988, but I'm in episode three, I'm going to go ahead and open up one of these. And, uh, listen, one of the star cards that you might be able to find is a, is a, uh, Bo, what is it? A Bo Jackson, I think, I think it's a Bo Jackson rookie card. Um, you know, worth, worth, worth some, uh, some, some coinage, um, But I just really wanted to take some time to talk about some of these collectible items that we've experienced throughout history and how entrepreneurs were able to take advantage of these moments, how entrepreneurs were responsible for creating markets and and the ebbs and flows of them. Um, The ones that did well and were able to scale and were timeless and the ones like the POG, right, like the POG here. Uh, that was just a, uh, a flash in the pan. And, uh, so I, I'm sure you guys have a number of, you know, collector's items that, that, that you can think of right now that you've experienced yourself or that, you know, throughout history. I'd love to know about them. So if you guys can find me online, find me, message me. I'd love to be able to create a list um, of all of these um, uh, collective items that were like a flash in the pan and we can create this list together and get all nostalgic um, and reminisce together about it, which is pretty cool. But in the next episode, I'm going to be bringing in um, actually someone who is a collector. Actually, it's Craig. Uh, Craig, who's a producer of Don't Fear Grit. 
He's also um, a, a collector of various items, and I don't want to give away uh, the entire show. I'm going to let him uh, later on for, for the next episode talk a little bit about it, but I'm going to bring him on. He also represents sort of the new collector as well, and he's ponied up some cash getting into the market and is being able to uh, experience some successes, uh, but we're going to be talking about um, everything that's brand new in the collector's market uh, right now um, in 2020, which is pretty cool. You know, We're going to be talking about are there any things like the POG? Um, I'm sure there are, and uh, but also, what are some of the collector's items that um, are timeless? That you know they've been around for a while and they still have tremendous amount of value. And uh, it, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna personally weigh in on the question of should entrepreneurs actually get their feet wet, dabble in the collector's market? Is there value there? Is it important? Is it an important skill? Is there something that entrepreneurs, regardless of the internet uh, um, industry that they are in, is it important for them to dabble in the collector's market? Can they get value and learn from it and apply it in their business? Um, so we're gonna be talking about that stuff. It's it's gonna be an amazing episode. I absolutely can't wait. But then also stick around for that last episode where I'm going to go ahead and open up a wax pack uh, from 1988, something that I've been saving literally from, uh, from 1988. And now is the time. Now is the time to open it up, which is pretty cool. So anyway, guys, uh, welcome back to Don't Fear Grit for this new uh, format that we're going to be pressing forward where we're going to be doing series. This series is about collectors and entrepreneurs. It's going to be awesome. 